great, thank you. So I thought I should begin, first of all, by explaining for those of you in the audience who might not know or might not be familiar with agent-based modeling, what exactly agent-based modeling is. Uh, so agent-based modeling is a type of computational model that simulates the behavior of autonomous agents in order to understand a complex system. In a historical setting, these agents can be anything from individuals to households to larger population groups, and they can be designed to behave as complexly uh, or as simply as one might desire. Uh, in such a model, agents are placed in an artificially constructed environment with rules that control how each agent reacts with that environment and with each other. Each agent has the same portfolio of variables, but the precise combination of variables in each agent is unique. As the agents in the system react, interact, and influence the environment and each other, various social phenomena can be observed to emerge. ABMs are thus concerned with the passage of time and how the system changes as a result of processes, processes that are hopefully analogous to the real world. So why should archaeologists model in this way? Well, historians and archaeologists create models all the time, sometimes formal mathematical ones, but most oftentimes these are informal narrative ones that simply explain how or why an event or a phenomenon comes to pass. And there are several different reasons an archaeologist might create a computational simulation. Um, I've listed four here. To testing qual uh, quantitative methods, hypothesis testing, uh, theory building, or even just as an educational tool. But the one I want to focus on is the, the third one in my list. Uh, and just mostly to point out that the goal of computational agent-based models doesn't have to be about proving a theory or definitively explaining a phenomenon once and for all. Rather, uh, it can just provide us with a means to more robustly interrogate our own understanding how things worked in the past. The act of creating a model, of choosing agents, of giving them characteristics, of writing their social rules in the form of algorithms, this forces us to clarify our own beliefs about how entities behaved and how various processes worked in the past. And importantly, it forces us to make explicit our own assumptions. In other words, agent-based modeling allows us to test, to critically examine, and to refine our conceptual models. Now, agent-based models have been widely employed in the social sciences for a long time to study complex systems and human behavior. In archaeology, ABM has gained a small but steadily increasing flow of adherence as a useful and promising method for understanding particular aspects of complex social systems and networks in the past. One of the most widely known and successful uh, early ABMs in archaeology is the artificial Anasazi model which successfully replicated the archaeologically documented settlement patterns of a prehistoric community in a valley in northwest Arizona over a period of 500 years. The model demonstrated that the eventual abandonment of the valley could not be explained by simple environmental factors. And the model also allows researchers, not only the ones who created it, but any researcher, to explore the relationship between resource availability, settlement location, and population growth. Uh, since about uh, 2000 or so, interest in ABMs has exploded in archaeology, and many agent-based models have been developed to lead insight, sorry, to lend insight into the formation of settlements and their evolution in a diverse range of historical environmental landscapes, ranging from Bronze Age Mesopotamia to hunter-gatherer groups in uh, Japan to the prehistoric settlements in the Peruvian Andes, pictured here. The act of modeling, that is, our, translating our understanding of how ancient societies worked into code, algorithms, uh, this facilitates cross-cultural comparison of social processes and mechanisms, which makes it a particularly appealing for interdisciplinary studies, particularly with regards to process. With regards to the emergence of urbanization and complex social systems, ABMs can be especially useful for disentangling the various external and internal factors that impact settlement structures in order to better theorize settlement nucleation and dispersion. This is what made it appealing to me when I started looking more closely at the rise of urbanism in early Egypt. So let me give a quick and dirty, uh, very oversimplified account of the role of the rise of urbanism and social complexity in early Egypt as we know it archaeologically. So the, the archaeological record suggests that the domestication of plants and animal animals took hold in the latter part of the 6th millennium BC. In the 5th millennium, we see the gradual establishment of what Egyptologists like to refer to as pastoral communities in the Nile Valley, partly nomadic, partly sedentary. Uh, and in the latter part of the 5th millennium, uh, we see the emergence of fully sedentary villages uh, in the western delta, the part that's labeled Lower Egypt. 
Um, and this seems to coincide with a gradual drying out of the, of the Western desert. Uh, around the beginning of the fourth millennium, uh, we see fully sedentary village life emerge in the upper Egyptian Nile Valley. Uh, and Egyptologists tend to characterize these as largely egalitarian small agri-communities. From that point, uh, there is a gradual process of population growth and transformation of the settlement landscape along the Nile Valley, from a system of loosely dispersed settlements along the desert zone, uh, along on the edge of the floodplain, to denser, more nucleated settlements within the floodplain itself. Um, grave goods from cemeteries, uh, usually placed in the desert fringes, also indicate that there is a growing social complexity and inequality at the same time. So in around 3500, 3400, we start to see the emergence of very clear settlement hierarchy and signs of urbanism in Upper Egypt, uh, by which I mean large-scale food production, pottery workshops, pointing to the uh, division of labor. Uh, especially in Upper Egypt, in the region of the Kennebend, uh, there are at least three significant urban centers surrounded by smaller village communities that emerge and grow larger than anything, anything found further north. Uh, these are frequently referred to in the literature as proto-kingdoms, but they're really just city-states, uh, characterized by differentiated wealth, social stratification, and complex networking with the surrounding villages. How big exactly are we talking? Uh, well, to take one of them, Hierakompolis, um, it's believed that by... Um, Around 3,400 or so, it was perhaps 5,000 to 10,000 people over an area of around 32 to 37 hectares. Not huge, but not tiny. Um, right. And so from around 3,400 or thereabouts onwards, these city-states grow, decline, power waxes and wanes, and eventually they coalesce, but the mechanisms aren't clear, either through warfare or other processes of elite comp cooperation and competition. Um, at the same time, they're also expanding influence and control towards the north, such that by around 3100, 3050, uh, the whole Nile Valley from the first cataract near Elephantine all the way to the Mediterranean is politically unified under the control of a, a single god king, the pharaohs that everyone knows and loves. Uh, but however, the, what I'm interested in is these three city-states and how the so-called uh, so small agri-communities from 4000 BC transformed by around 3500 BC into these city-state <laughs> systems. This is a fairly short period of time. And in particular, I'm interested in the beginning of the process, uh, as was mentioned at the very beginning of the session this morning. Uh, if indeed the Nile Valley was populated by small, roughly egalitarian farming communities, each with a handful of households, what catalyst, what factor or factors changed this and led to settlement hierarchy, agglomeration, and population shifts? Answering this has proved problematic for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, the archaeological record is very poor. Most of our information comes from cemeteries on the desert fringes, not the settlements themselves. Uh, there's many of the settlements have been buried under 5,000 years of cultivation. Uh, and uh, also the pre-dynastic period, as opposed to the pharaonic period, didn't really attract a lot of really uh, focused scientific exploration until the last few decades. Uh, the other reason it's difficult to answer this question is that there's a um, is that a lot of the explanations that have been put forward for the origin of cities and social complexity, both in the case of Egypt and for other ancient states, just don't hold up. Uh, there's no evidence of, of outside military threat. Uh, there's uh, while well, trade becomes a factor later, it doesn't seem to have played much of a role uh, initially. Um, it's more involved with the later polity competition. Uh, population pressure. Uh, the record suggests that the Nile Valley was significantly underpopulated throughout the pre-dynastic period. Uh, what about environmental factors? Well, the Nile River, uh, its associated floodplain and the bordering dry steppelands was a very subsistence-friendly environment. With its annual inundation, uh, the Nile uh, River both refreshed and fertilized the fields. And basic basin irrigation is relatively simple. It doesn't require great collaboration and can be controlled locally. So the grand hydraulic theories of the early 20th century don't really seem to apply here either. And geoarchaeological analysis shows that while the Nile flood did experience variability from year to year in the pre-dynastic, this is not that dramatic enough to force large-scale cooperation. Rather, uh, long periods of low Niles becomes a feature of the third millennium. So there's really no evidence that the population numbers in the early fourth millennium ever reached anything that would have put pressure on the abundant natural resources provided by the Nile ecosystem. So as one researcher has put it, there's, wild, well, there's water, there's wind, and there's sun in abundance. 
So the environment appears more to be a passive rather than a driving factor. And thus we need to look for internal social factors within the communities themselves. Barry Kemp put forward a theoretical reconstruction of the process and um, in his influential book from 1989, I believe it is. And we find the theory further in the second edition in 2006. And he likens the whole thing to a monopoly game. Uh, the way he paints it, paints the picture, you have an agricultural landscape of unlimited potential and players initially are all on equal footing. Um, they compete somewhat unconsciously, maybe more consciously, and the initial egalitarian state doesn't last. Uh, the advantage changes from player to player through a combination of chance and personal decisions. Uh, eventually, the, advantage, uh, uh, the advantageous position of one or more players reinforces itself. Uh, certain players rise above in a more or less entrenched ways. Others drop out from boredom or fatigue. So in Kemp's version, the factors leading to growth and social complexity in early Egypt then are the landscape, uh, chance, and personal decisions. The, the human portion of this being driven by an attachment to land and an inne innate need to compete. So in collaboration with the computer science department at the University of Cape Town, we're constructing an agent-based model and attempt to explore Kemp's conceptual model uh, in computational form in order to explore how a combination of human decision-making, environmental factors, and chance uh, interconnect to result in the settlement system and rise of social complexity that is witnessed in the archaeological record. And especially, we are interested in the challenge of modeling decision-making. Traditionally, in agent-based situations in archaeology, agents are imbued with a rationality that's based on biological or modern economical theories, uh, with the understanding that the definition of rational behavior is doing what is right or makes sense from the point of view of the information possessed. This can be criticized uh, in that rationality and subsequently decision-making are affected not just by knowledge, but also emotion, personality, character, physiology. And such traits are typically have not been incorporated into models, feeding into a criticism that these models are unrealistic with their homogenous agents. Uh, this is put very uh, aptly in a 1991 article where the uh, researcher uh, referred to a model as a cybernetic wasteland full of agents that behave artificially with a single mindset. For example, it seems logically untenable that all farmers would farm the land to the best of their, of their ability and all make similar decisions. What about the tired or lazy farmer or the frustrated farmer, the one who gives up? Uh, the farmer that only thinks for the short term versus the one who thinks for the long term. So recent archeological modelers have pushed back on this, uh, investigating how we can incorporate physiological and psychological motivation in order to create a diverse and more believable population. And this is very much a goal driving our model. So I'm going to have to uh, rush through or skip through this, but I'm happy to answer questions later on about exactly how we designed um, our model. Uh, we use a program called NetLogo. It's used by many social scientists uh, to create an abstracted version of the Nilotic floodplain. Uh, our agents are households. They simply engage in farming on a yearly basis, collecting grain, consuming grain, storing grain. Um, the variables are all the same for all the agents except for three where they're placed, where their settlement is placed, that's randomly set at the beginning, and then they're assigned an ambition and competence value. This is randomly set at the beginning of the run, and it changes every 10 to 15 years to reflect a generational changeover, right? A kind of shift in, um, a shift in the head of the household, if you will. Um, so just as in Kemp's conceptual model, the whole run starts out with everyone having equal resources um, at the beginning. Uh, as I said, I, I think I covered this in the last one. Here's a picture of what the model would look like. This is kind of what happens um, uh, step by step each year. The Nile floods, we use an equation to simulate the Nile variation from, ver um, from year to year. Uh, using this equation, um, patches of land are given a fertility value. Uh, then depending on the agent's ambition and competence, uh, ambition and competence affect uh, their decisions in terms of which lands they decide to harvest, which lands they, try, uh, they decide to claim, how successful they are at the harvest, um, and the likelihood that they will then um, repopulate and gain um, more population members. Households that do not uh, make enough, uh, harvest enough grain, they lose population uh, numbers. Those that uh, do and maintain a sur surplus, they have a greater chance of gaining population numbers. And this is to simulate the idea of the emergence of a labor force that can uh, move around to, um, to different places. 
just to show very quickly um, some of the results from a, a certain set of ex experiments, we ran basically three experiments. Um, and just to step away from the microphone and point it out. So in experiment one, all of the households were all given optimal um, competence and ambition. Um, in the second one, they were given um, slightly variation in ambition and competence, but it's, it's only a very slight variation between them. In the third experiment, the, the potential variation between the households is very, very large. Not surprisingly, this is exactly what we expected, right? That you start to see um, a divergence of the population relatively quickly, and it gets more entrenched and bigger as time goes on. Um, we were a bit more surprised to notice that even in the one where we all the agents are completely the same, they all have optimum ambition and competence. They're just they're the best. Um, they have, they can get they can make the most of the land. It's still you have you still have. Um, differentiation emerging after around 250 years, uh, which seems to be a factor of the, where the settlement's located and the initial choices made in terms of claiming land. Uh, and each line obviously represents a different settlement. And this is just the same data in table form, and I just wanted to point out again then the numerical difference. In the one where they're more or less equal, what happens is that after 500 years, the um, largest settlement is about twice the size of the smallest settlement. Uh, in the uh, experiment where they have a lot of divergence and ambition and competence, the largest settlement after 500 years is 10 times the size of the smallest settlement. And my, my, this is my final slide. Um, and uh, the whole point of this and what we're trying to do initially, and I should point out that this is we're at the very, very beginning stages of uh, our project is that we wanted just to explore and show how uh, very small changes in agent behavior can have long-term significant uh, outcomes and to show how even in a, a landscape that is uniform for all um, individuals um, how this can uh, play a role in showing and in, in playing out what we actually see in the archaeological record right now we can kind of make camps theory work um, and I should say we can make it work also in terms of wealth differentiation. That's one settlement on the left. You can see for each individual household, each line is a different household. You can see the wealth going up and down for different households over time. Moving forward, this is the range of possible additions, um, uh, factors and parameters that we're going to add to make the model more realistic, more uh, complex, and hopefully more helpful. The idea being both that we can make better use of the evidence, the very poor evidence of Upper, Dina uh, upper Egypt and the pre-dynastic, but also push forward uh, the intellectual discussion of uh, the rise of urbanism in antiquity. Thank you. Mm -hmm.